Well, it's a spring day in the south of England. We're deep in the woods here in the New Forest on the border of Hampshire and Wiltshire, where I live. And I came in the woods today just to have a look at the bluebells because it is the quintessentially English spring flower. They like a mist on the ground. There's no sun out, what a pity, but never mind. They look lovely down there. And as I was walking along the path, my memory went back to a time about 15 years ago when the old gentleman who owned this little bit of woodland here brought me in here to show me something. I'd been speaking at a meeting about restoring woodland, which was something I knew very little about, but I did know something about restoring historic ships. And there was a national body had taken over this bit of woodland and it was rooting out a lot of chestnut trees, uh, horse, um, sweet chestnut trees, uh, to the enragement of the local population. And I said to them, well, what period are you actually trying to reproduce here? And they said, oh, well, probably I think about the restoration, sort of middle of the 17th century. And I was proudly able to point out to them that the sweet chestnut trees were brought here by the Romans and had been established for over a thousand years in 1650. And that sort of shut them up a bit. And the old boy was rather tickled by this because he was cross because he'd, he'd let the land to these, to these guys whose hearts were in the right place, but they weren't getting it right. And um, he said to me, I didn't know you were interested in ships. He said, uh, I want to show you something. Come down tomorrow and I'll take you into the woods. So he did. And today, I was hoping I was going to be able to find what he showed me, but you know, I'm hanged if I can, but it doesn't matter because we're surrounded here by all sorts of deciduous trees and in particular oak trees, which built the great navies of England, the wooden walls of England were built, many of them, from oak trees pulled out of the new forest. And when an oak tree was growing, the foresters would size it up, talk to the shipwrights, and they'd say, yeah, we could have a go at this one. And they would pollard it, they would cut the top off and encourage it to go in different directions to create curved knees and curved crooks to build the ships with. And I think we may have one here, I, I'm not sure, but uh, this one has got a lot of curve in it and there's quite a lot of branches coming out of the top. It looks as though it might have lost its top at one stage. Um, I don't know, I'm not enough of an expert, but suffice it to say the old gentleman took me to see one that had absolutely obviously been done that way and it had been done 200 years ago by the shipwrights who were taking trees out to build Nelson's Navy. And when they saw a small young tree that they could do something with, they doctored it and they knew that they were never going to reap the reward, or their children, or maybe even their grandchildren, but they did it anyway. And that was a way of living that we're tending to forget now. When I had the pilot cutter and I took her to America, I took her up to the Arctic and then down to America. And when I got to America, I was rowing under the stern of the boat, big lovely counter stern up above me and I looked up and I thought oh this doesn't look too good and I pulled out my knife and I stuck it in and it went right in oh no and there was rot in the in in this what we call the stern chock um, which is the piece of wood the great big piece of wood that runs across the stern of the boat at the end of the counter that all the planks land on so it had to go so we chopped it out and while we were chopping it out I realized that the horn timber the great big piece of oak like this that runs up inside the counter had been butting up against that and of course it's showing it its end grain and nobody had seen it for 80 years. I thought well it's bound to be rotten and what am I going to do then because I'm no shipwright. I can probably replace this piece of wood and maybe a couple of planks but that's going to be beyond me. I didn't have any money so I was really alarmed about what I was going to find and as I cut away and cut away slowly the horn timber revealed itself and as it did it did there was something strange about it when I was looking at it and I poked about and I realized that the man who built that boat 80 years before had covered the end of the horn timber with pitch knowing that if anything got in there it would go straight down the end grain and he didn't let it happen he didn't have to do that nobody would have seen it he could have covered it up with the horn timber and no, with, with the with the stern chock nobody would have known the difference but he was thinking and he was thinking about me who he'd never met he'd never even met my granddad he didn't know who i was but he did it for me and maybe we should all think about that and try and do something for somebody else, somebody else's grandchildren, something we can leave behind that somebody else will benefit from. And meanwhile, I'm going to go and enjoy the bluebells.